Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Festival Place, the Pineapples in association with the Design Council. This is a unique event where we bring together developers, designers and placemakers from across the built environment to share their work as they vie to win a golden pineapple for place. Uh, this is the second session in public space, which is a category of projects shortlisted for their contribution to the urban life of a wider place. We have six projects shortlisted in this category, and we're about to hear from two more of them. Each team will have just 10 minutes to present. Our judges will then have 10 minutes to ask questions. In the interest of fairness, I'll be in charge of interrupting if our teams go over time. We'll be meeting all our judges in a moment as they respond to our first presenter, but I'm gonna take a moment to introduce them now so you can know how wonderful they are. There's Dan Anderson, co-founder and director of Fourth Street, which advises clients like you and I, Delancey and the Crown Estate on the delivery of unique and special places. There's Elizabeth Rappaport, Head of Strategy at Homes England, who's an urban planner, researcher, and strategist who leads on embedding government policy and market insight into agency-wide strategies to tackle the housing challenges. And there's Kenan Ivers, Director of LDA Design, who works on urban parks and public spaces and is the author of the book, Staging Urban Landscapes on the Activation and Curation of Public Space. So thanks so much to our dedicated judges. I can see all your emoji applause for them. Many of them have visited these places or they've all visited at least one of these public spaces and will be sharing their insights from their visits as well as responding to the presentations they see here today. So I'd now like to uh, introduce our first project in this session, which is uh, Christchurch Gardens in Victoria, London, which is presented by Ed Freeman from Reardon Smith Art Landscape Architects and Catherine, sorry, Reardon Smith Landscape and Catherine Fleming from the Victoria Bid. And this green space reopened to the public in September 2020. So tell us all about it. Hi everyone. Yes, yeah, thanks for the introduction and thanks for having us today. Um, I'm going to be really, really quick and set some context and then hand over to Ed, um, obviously, because he's been really, really fully en engrossed in this um, as far as the written uh, landscapes are concerned. So Christchurch Garden sits in the city of Westminster and it's close to the popular tourist destinations such as the Houses of Parliament and Buckingham Palace. Um, the area for us is a local area rich of diverse mix of businesses and really has strong hospitality sector. It's also home to loads of residents and schools and youth clubs and we, it really does comprise of an affluent area as well that sits alongside more of a deprived area and there is significant percentage of social rented housing. Um, for us, from a Victoria Business Improvements District's perspective, this has been a priority project for us to deliver and we are so pleased to be working with Westminster City Council to deliver this. Um, from our perspective, we invested 380,000 into this project and with Westminster putting in 1.2 million. So um, it's, we're really, really pleased with the results. So I'm gonna hand over to Ed now to really go through the screen and the slides. Thank you, Catherine. This first slide shows the existing Christchurch uh, garden site four years ago in 2017, when we first- Hi, started sorry, I'm work. going to interrupt Ed because we can't see your slides. We'll just stay with you until we've got it all shared and then we can kick off. That's it, uh, just into presentation. Beautiful, well done, Apologies. carry on. Sorry about that. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so this first slide shows the existing Christchurch garden site four years ago in 2017 when we first started work on the project. Located in a dense urban area, the site had a series of challenging conditions that we sought to address from physical barriers of walls, hedging and timber fences blocking desire lines, lack of seating, poor light and bare soils, uh, bare areas of soil within the lawn, lack of natural surveillance, failing planting and low biodiversity value. Unfortunately, this created a space that the local community actively avoided and as such allowed the prevalence of antisocial behaviour to dominate. The fascinating history of this unique green space stretches back to the 13th century. It is a former burial ground of St Margaret's Church, which still stands adjacent to West Westminster Abbey. The site is next to Caxton Hall, the meeting place of the suffragettes who would march from this spot to wet Parliament and a bronze charter scroll features in the gardens. 
A number of interesting burials are thought to be located on site, including Ignatius Sancho, the first Black Briton to vote, and Colonel Thomas Blood, failed thief of crown jewels, and one Margaret Batten, who died in 1739 at the reputed age of 136. Through project research at City of Westminster Archives, we uncovered an 1846 burial record book, and the 136 hand-drawn plates were photographed and stitched to form a burial map on the right of your screen. And after close review, we found at square D2 the name of Sancho, proof that uh, he was buried on this site and providing new evidence of it. The sub uh, subterranean conditions were carefully surveyed in conjunction with the Museum of London Archaeology to understand the extent of burials on site. And this survey was overlaid onto the burial map to inform the trial pit investigations. For centuries, this space has been used for the gathering of communities, encouraging voices to be heard and providing a haven for refuge from life to death. The transformation of Christchurch Gardens has been informed by historical research and site investigations and surveys, guided by best practice and steered by community consultation to deliver quantifiable results. Extensive collaboration was undertaken through consultation with the local community, adjacent landowners, local residents and workers, and a three-day public consultation event was also held, which attracted over 100 attendees. The project's aims and objectives align with the three main topics from the Gale Institute's quality criteria of protection, comfort and enjoyment. And the project's aims and objectives include creating a space that in people enjoy spending time in and where they can engage with each other and to increase opportunities for seating. Maximising the site's biodiversity through diverse planting with extended flowering periods of pollinator friendly plants. Establishing a relationship between the gardens and adjacent strut and ground market recognising pedestrian desire lines, to design out crime and address antisocial behaviour, to allow for the future relationship of adjacent premises to the gardens. Storytelling, accessibility and biodiversity are key components of the transformation of Christchurch Gardens to create a welcoming new public realm. Located within a conservation, the site is surrounded by a variety of architectural styles and the design balances this varied vernacular with a material palette curated upon the colours and materiality of its surroundings to complement the setting and allow the new planting to become the focus. Westminster Council's technical standards were innovatively reinterpreted with a unique bespoke paving design to tell the story of the site's hidden underground history. A bold geometric pattern with granite coffin-shaped pavers appears hidden when dry to transform when wetened, with re wetened by rain with subtler Yorkstone coffin-shaped pavers and pathways. Other subtle bespoke detailing includes carved ecclesiastical notches as skateboard deterrents. The site layout was rearranged to create new and improve existing paths to to better connect the space with the adjacent Stratton ground food market and to encourage people to walk through the gardens. To maximize a flexible and fully accessible lawn space, planting was positioned around the garden boundaries adjacent to walkways to allow enjoyment from both inside the garden and from surrounding streets. The new inclusive design allows greater accessibility for all with a near seven fold increase in seating with armrests and backs to several benches for the mobility impaired. The garden is now welcoming with places for all visitors. A new performance space enables communal activity whilst elsewhere there are places for contemplation. The central lawn allows for groups of friends to gather and flexible play for children or family picnics. One of the greatest successes of the project is the balancing of the past with the present. The design incorporates key improvements and storytelling as a former site of Christchurch and St Margaret's burial grounds to provide a restful neighbourhood green space. A composition of high quality natural stone, timber and bronze finishes instills a character of permanence and historical importance to the new space with robust elements finessed with elegant lines and intricate details akin to the materiality and presence of the former church and burial ground gravestones. Even the backs of benches with their bolted metal straps echo church door bracing. A new contemporary historical interpretation board also provides more detailed information to cater for those who wish to stop and pause. At night, new gobo projectors provide an illustrative backdrop to the pathways, depicting the seasonal planting and affording new lit routes through the gardens. One of the key quantifiable results as displayed in these photos is that the community have come back to Christchurch Gardens. Without people, a place is just a space. 
The increase in seating and new performance space enables communal activity, creating a place, sorry, creating a place where people want to visit, a high quality space that is well cared for and loved to engender a feeling of safety and community ownership to address the broken windows theory. Clear open routes are provided, providing a feeling of openness and visibility to allow people to both sit on their own within a communal space or to meet up with friends in larger groups. The design of the garden sought to create flexible edges and respond to future redevelopment of adjacent sites with removable climber seating, sorry, screening to the northern boundary and a wide paved area to the western boundary to allow for animation by an active retail cafe edge, for example. The environmental improvement in Christchurch Gardens forms part of a series of urban greening interventions and public realm enhancements that have been led by Victoria Bid over recent years to provide a wider network of green infrastructure across the area. The approach is informed by reports such as the Green Infrastructure Audit and a Public Realm Strategy. Alongside Victoria Street, the new linear planting bed afford a new biodiverse corridor with log piles to attract stag beetles and bird and bat boxes are also included. Delayed pruning of seed heads and grasses was, propo was proposed during winter to extend foraging for birds. The SUD strategy aims to retain 100% of water runoff on site through the introduction of permeable paving and subterranean diffusion units. Information about the SUDS treatment is also included in the history panel text to raise awareness of this type of approach. Sustainability is also promoted through the provision of a drinking water fountain to encourage water bottle reuse. Planting proposals focus on creating habitats that encourage biodiversity and the planting design selected over 50% of species from the RHS Plants for Pollinators list, with 79 new species totalling over 3,700 new plants within the proposals. New seating placed adjacent to planting positions users close to floral displays with paths planted with jasmine climbers to provide additional scent to create a colourful edge alluding to the former church's stained glass windows. Configuration of benches allow users to sit in either the sun or the shade and with the addition of yew uh, planting provides evergreen structure whilst referencing its traditional use in graveyards. Selected tree removal in the centre of the garden provides much needed light and clear views to the sky framed by the mature trees along the garden edges affording an improved connection to daylight and connection with nature. The prevalence of green public space in the city has never been as important as it is now for health and well-being. Christchurch Garden is about creating a welcoming place from day to night to encourage the local community to become custodians of their city spaces. Since opening, the scheme has prompted positive feedback from businesses and residents. And as I bring this presentation to a close, we look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks so much for sharing that. Really nice to have the potted history as well as uh, a, a really um, comprehensive look of what's happening now. Um, Kenan, can I bring you in first for your uh, questions and if you would like to, to join us? Of course. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Ed, and thank you, Catherine. Nice to see you. Uh, it's a very comprehensive presentation, so you haven't left us much space for questions, I must say, Ed. But, uh, so <laughs> I have one question, I suppose, to ask you around lessons learned around the flexible area that you're trying to create. You can see that you, there, I can see the tension in the designer of trying to work out, should it all be hard space, should we leave this sliver of lawn? What are the lessons that you've learned there as far as determining the scale of that space? And do you sense that that small sliver of lawn will stand the test of time uh, as it becomes more and more of a popular space? I say that because the, the couple of times I visited, there's always people sitting in that small sliver of grass even though you have this large, expansive lawn area. So yeah, what are your views on that? Well, I think that's uh, an interesting question and um, it's well uh, well placed actually, because um, let's, let's address that small sliver of lawn. Um, that was actually added on uh, after the public consultation. And um, as you were sort of alluding to, it's a difficult balance between hard and soft, getting that balance right. You don't want to make it too hard. You don't want to make it too soft that actually um, it doesn't uh, provide a robust um, landscape or provide the paths and desire lines it needs. So that small slip of lawn was actually added after the public consultation to try and address um, perceived concerns that perhaps there could be more green space. Um, I think what's right is actually putting green space where it will survive. 
as well. Um, so it, like all these sort of spaces, um, they are undergoing a sort of period of trial. You know, you, you have to test spaces, see how people want to use them. Um, I think we've got it pretty, pretty much spot on. Um, I think um, one of the key uh, positives was increasing the amount of benches on site um, sevenfold. Um, the success of public space is down to benches, bums on seats, and um, and, and that has been brilliant to provide fle flexible space for people to use, whether they want to sit on the lawn as well, or the banks of the lawn, or sit on the edges, or sit on the seats, uh, perhaps they're able to push themselves up and down. So um, uh, yeah, um, hopefully that has um, perhaps answered your question, perhaps in a roundabout way, but yeah. Can I do a follow-up? Great, Christine, well, that right? uh, you have another question? I just wanted to ask if that space has been tested at all yet. Have you had market stalls or, or anything like that in that? Unfortunately, with COVID obviously happening, uh, we haven't been able to do that. It's very much, if I do speak for probably Catherine and, and David Beamont, who unfortunately couldn't be here, is on holiday, who was uh, the project manager for the project from the bid, uh, Victoria bid. Um, it, that was one of the key project objectives of having um, silent cinema or, or um, seasonal events and um, coffee carts and um, public um, public sort of performances. Um, one of the other sculpt on site is Henry Purcell and that was for his uh, tricentenary um, and uh, actually Ignatius Sancho it was recently well not so recently maybe about a year or so ago there was a play um, uh, done uh, by a very famous actor and um, he wanted to come down and actually give a recital of, of the play or parts of the play and I think it's that connection to space and place and history that's really really important so um, we haven't they uh, I believe that they, they haven't been able to have those sort of events but um, I was down there last week and my goodness everyone is using that space it's a it's a, it, it gets I just had a shiver down my spine that's the bit that you know Wow, that, that's really great. Yeah, four years of design, um, stressing over design details and all the rest to actually see people using the space uh, and flexibly, you know, groups of teenagers, of, of girls sitting uh, on a seat uh, or um, other people sitting on their own, you know, maybe an elderly gentleman sitting in the corner. Everyone is just happy to be in the space. So it's, it's really nice. We've been getting great feedback from, uh, from residents. We had a green flagger. <laughs> Green Flag Judging Award last week and uh, one of the residents uh, came along and, and was singing its praises and you just need to go on Twitter to see to, even today people are Twitter tweeting about um, the trackless burnham jasmoides hedge down down the side that provides this beautiful scent um, and really it's a special place. Sorry Catherine I'm talking too oh, much. No 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 I was just going to add as part of our Kings and Queens summer campaign for the Victoria bid we are actually going to we've got some events that are planned there um, now that the restrictions have been lifted. So we're going to see some soft play where we'll have some just some gentle games around for people to play, which we know has gone down well in, in Victorian Embankment Gardens in North Bank. And um, there'll be a, a kind of like a slow programme of events that we'll build over the, the coming months leading into September. So, yeah, there is absolutely a programme for us to kind of really test that space on the curation and activation. I'm going to bring you in now, Elizabeth. Um, would you, if you'd like to uh, put your questions? Yeah. So the Homes England office is actually adjacent to that space, so I can confirm your observations, Ed. I, I don't go to the office very much, but when I do go there, I look out onto it, and I can confirm that it is very actively used, including by me when I uh, want to have a nice place to sit and eat my lunch. Right <laughs> much appreciated. <laughs> um, and I yes, hear about how much of an improvement it is from colleagues who've been at the agency longer longer than I have. Um, so so yeah, I've I've experienced this space a lot. A really really uh, comprehensive presentation. You spoke a lot about inclusion, inclusion of people, inclusion of species. There was one reference to an activity you wanted to exclude, and you mentioned the notches put into the benches to stop skateboarding. One of the really common things with public space in central city areas is thinking not just about what you want to ex include, but often exclude and, and, and really appreciate that you haven't gone to the extremes that mistakes have been made in the past in terms of going too hostile in design in order to exclude uses. But I'd be interested to hear kind of a little bit about the thought process that you went through in design about not just what you wanted to include, but what, what you want to exclude and the, the sensitivity with which you did that. Cause like it's clear from your reference that that was very carefully considered. Yeah, thank you for that observation. Um, 
as you may well know, the site, as I alluded to before, had um, some social issues on on site. Um, uh, that is not that, that that social issues were things like littering, um, uh, alcohol drinking, uh, drug taking, um, and things like that, and and even using more discrete areas of the site as a, a public convenience. That is uh, unacceptable for public space, really. Um, and um, we had to sensitively do that. Um, and what we try to do is provide greater passive surveillance uh, and actually address the broken windows theory. It, it sort of sounds textbook, but my goodness, well, we think we've got it right. It, it seems to have worked really, really well, but no one solution can solve um, those particular antisocial issues on site. Um, and those are the only so antisocial issues I'm talking about. Um, with regards to skateboarding, I mean, interestingly, um, it's the, I think it's regarded as num it was regarded as number two skateboarding spot in, in London after the South Bank. Um, Vicky benches, they used to call them, that were uh, apparently amazing to grind or do whatever you want on them. Um, uh, the, the composition of the concrete made it this really polished surface. Now, we were wary of that. Um, one of our friends at, at my, my company um, highlighted it to me and showed me what they were doing. They were getting hammers and knocking off uh, the, the notches on the anti-skateboard things, providing quite dangerous, sharp surface, what they left. Look, I, I think everyone should, should be able to enjoy public space. It's just about balancing that. So as what we tried to do and what we did do was um, actually get in touch with some skate brands. And um, we, um, with the blessing of Westminster, uh, City of Westminster, um, managed to um, contact these skate bands to try and repurpose those benches um, because they were so loved. So it, there's a lot of thinking that you don't see just by walking in that garden. Um, and yeah, it, 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 uh, it seems to have worked well in that respect. But with regards to social issues, uh, I know Catherine and her team, uh, in conjunction with many other um, uh, um, other departments, I suppose, within Westminster and other charities, do a, a, a world of good um, uh, in some of the some of the issues within Westminster. But the particular issues that we tried to address on site were anti-social issues, and, and I hide those three things before. Yeah, I'll just echo what Ed said. We we work really closely with our clean team and the collaboration with Westminster on patrol and, and just continually monitor the area to make sure that it's maintained to its highest standard. And the ongoing maintenance for us is really important that it is kept to that high level. Um, so we're re working really closely um, with them still on that. Uh, we just have a couple minutes left, so I want to bring you in, Dan. Uh, sure. Well, hopefully this is a, a fairly straightforward one because I think you touched on it uh, already. Um, uh, I, I, I was there last um, Saturday um, and I have been there previously having bought something uh, from that food market. And I know that, you know, lunchtime on a weekday when there isn't a pandemic, it's heaving. Um, on a Saturday afternoon in the middle of a pandemic, it was positively serene. People in it, but it was at this oasis of tranquility. Uh, but I sat there, uh, and it, probably of all the spaces, this one was the one where I was where I was thinking, I wonder what this place is like at night. Uh, and I know that you touched on a little bit of the the lighting, but it, could you just expand a little bit on on how it's managed and and how it feels and operates uh, at night time? Sure. Um... I think well, the, 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 exist, the pre-existing site conditions, not the existing at the moment, but uh, the pre-existing site conditions um, had a lot of barriers and uh, mid-levels, that sort of mid-level shrub uh, height where people could hide behind, could sit on ledges, and people often did. Um, and that provided a, a sort of sense of forbearing and, and um, what's going to happen. Um, there was lighting on site previously, but we did put more lighting. Um, we, we, we improved the lighting. But what we didn't want to do is flood the place with light. We didn't want to do that. Um, there is There are residents uh, nearby adjacent. We did actually, in the early concept design, come up with some really cool proposals. But we didn't want to upset local residents with too much light. I think we've got the balance about right. We've got um, both wayfinding lighting and we've got these gobo globe lights, which project a beautiful arc, well, not arc, but a series of art installations um, uh, across the, the outer path. 
But one of the key things was actually to provide a path that skims the outer surface as well and provides a clear route. So you know, you can see yourself from, from start to finish, you know where your route's going and you've got a clear uh, line of sight. So it's become more open, um, more open when the space, uh, less places to hide. And um, the, uh, one of the ladies, uh, sorry, who came on the green flag, uh, she's the manager of the Conrad. And she said she, even in the evening now, she can walk across the site. She never did before. Um, and she feels it's safe enough to, 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 to walk across. So it's great to get that feedback. Um, so hopefully that answered your question. That's great. Well, I'm afraid that's our time. So I just want to say thank you both for uh, your presentation, for sharing that with us and to our judges for their brilliant questions as always. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce our next uh, shortlisted project, which is Chelsea Barracks Westminster, um, where a unique garden uh, dedicates a series of, um, uh, of sorry, where 40% of its site was dedicated to Belgravia Square Gardens. <laughs> so it got tangled up there. Um, so uh, please welcome um, Stephen Hill. You're here. Brilliant. I'll just stay with you as you share your slides. Uh, Stephen, I don't think I can hear you. Can you say something? Yeah, can you hear me now? Sorry? Yes, I can hear you now. Yeah. And you so can see my screen hopefully, yes? Yes, it just needs to be in presentation mode. Okay, perfect. Full screen now. Right, so that's on full screen. Can you see that okay? Hmm. Can you try, instead of outline view, um, something else? Uh, Sorry. Is that any better? No. no. I think. Um, uh, hi, Steve. You, Steve. you might want to try and go out and um, and try and reshare just your whole screen, your desktop, and then do it that way. Okay, I'll try again. Sorry. Um, it's not the yeah. That should work. Thank you, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> so if you do share screen and maybe try entire screen instead of just window if that's what you did last time yeah i did last time yeah okay so that's not working and then well um, and, yeah, and then we'll screen it from there right or a slideshow is that better? That's great. Yes, that's perfect. Right. Okay, over to you, Stephen. Thank you. You, you would, sorry, you'd think after a year of doing this, I'd be better at it. I do apologize. Um, so good afternoon. My name is uh, Stephen Hill. I am from uh, Squire Partners, and today I will explain the, the approach to the master plan for Chelsea Barracks. Um, the Chelsea Barracks project uh, was an opportunity to reconnect, reconnect a significant part of the city back into its context. It has uh, four um, boundaries to the site, each with their own very distinct uh, character. Uh, to the left of the site is uh, Chelsea Bridge Road. Um, this is the uh, a, a tree-lined um, avenue, which effectively connects uh, the river to, to Hyde Park. Uh, Pimlico Road along the north, or, or along the top of the, the page there, is a lively uh, retail street with cafes. Um, shops, antique shops, and uh, a freight, a weekend and farmer's market. Um, Ebury Bridge Road to the, to the bottom of the image there is a much more uh, domestic um, street with a mix of tenures and uh, utilitarian sort of convenience, um, convenience store retail uh, along the, the street. Um, and St Barnabas Street is um, a variety or it has a variety of 19th century um, terraced houses. So these were the main sort of issues and aspirations for the master plan. At the heart of it was to the, the ensure the permeability um, of the layer of the streets and spaces that are um, accessible to the public. Um, there is a diversity of, of, of scale and character led by its context, and it recognises the history of the site as well, particularly the, the Ranley Grove and the St Barnabas um, um, Spire. Um, on site is the Garrison Chapel, which we've retained to create a local um, village square. Um, as I said, we've respected the view to the St Barnabas um, Spire. And um, the, the landscaping itself is led by productive gardens, um, 
related to the site history. Um, essentially, the, the spaces came first and the buildings were residual to the master plan. Um, we've also introduced water concourses um, through, through the, the site if, in memory of the Westbourne River, which runs nearby. And again, servicing and car access is at grade. So um, much of the character of London town planning um, is led by the garden square. The square formed the, the essential element within the various London estates, and it's London's gift to um, town planning. In, in central London, the squares tend to be square, um, Covent Garden and Hanover Square are such examples. And moving westwards, the, the squares became much more rectangular in form. Um, this was largely or probably driven by the needs or the desire to have more um, houses or build more houses around the central space. But what it does do is it does give um, uh, West London a very distinct appearance um, in terms of that sort of um, typology. So Eaton Square and Condoggin Square are very good examples of these um, rect rectangular sort of linear um, squares. So the master plan draws on that vernacular and you can see the master plan in the centre of the, the image here, um, basically connecting back in or, or evo evocative of the existing um, wider context. So it's, it's, it's vitally important um, that there's a mix of uses within the master plan just to ensure it doesn't just become a residential uh, dormitory. We include um, uh, retail, restaurants, um, there's a sports hall for community use, and there's a doctor's surgery as well. Um, so that mix of uses ensures the, the development is a natural part of the city and provides immunity for the, the wider community. Um, the, the essential idea then behind the master plan is um, the generation of streets and squares that are naturally connected to the, to the local townscape. Um, sustainability was a key driver in the master plan design as well. Um, we are really proud to say that we've recently achieved um, a LEED Platinum certification for the Chelsea Barracks master plan. It's one of the only 16 projects globally to achieve this and the only one in Europe. Um, considering the history and recognising the importance of history and in, in, in tying the place back to or tying this, the site back into its place, there's um, a long history of market gardens in, in and around the site. And we've, um, we've um, adapted that or, or, or brought that into our master plan with the inclusion of orchards and a productive vegetable garden. So the squares themselves, um, Whistler Square is a, is a hard, is an urban hard landscape square uh, surrounded by apartments and townhouses and it's the main entrance to um, the development from Pimlico Road. Mulberry Square is where we have the uh, productive garden, which will provide herbs and spices for um, the restaurants in Garrison Square. And it complements the, uh, the Chelsea Flower Show, which is held every May in the uh, Royal uh, Hospital, which is um, basically to the south of, or to the, the bottom of this image here, um, across Chelsea Bridge Road. Leading into uh, Garrison Square, um, this is the village square for the, the development. Um, on the left hand side, you can see the existing Garrison Church, which is Grade 2 listed. Um, this, this will have, um, it's surrounded by retail, it's surrounded by restaurants, and it will accommodate um, a farmer's market, which will, um, will tie into the market that's already on uh, Pimlico Road. The Fifield Square is a much more traditional uh, London square. It's accessible to the public from dawn till dusk and it offers a place to um, relax under the trees um, and, and, and play in the grass and in the fields. The Orchard Square um, provides a private amenity for the houses that um, um, are situated there or wrap around that square. And as you can see from the um, aerial photograph of their model, um, the predominance of the, of the public or the, the squares there is over 40% of the site is given over to open um, public space. So in the next, in the next few slides, I'll take you for a stroll around the constructed, uh, the constructed parts of the master plan. 
Um, this features buildings by Squire and Partners, uh, PDP, Eric Parry and Ben Pindreith, and uh, landscaping design by Gustafus and Porter and Bowman. Um, so Dove Place is uh, it marks a transition from um, from Pimlico Road. Pimlico Road is, runs along parallel to the Pitcher Plain, and this offers a a, a break between the um, existing buildings and the start of Chelsea Barracks. It also offers um, an entrance into uh, Whistler Square, which you can see here. This is the view looking back uh, towards Pimlico Road. Um, it's where the entrance is to the, the main apartment block on the left-hand side and the townhouses that are on the right, which are much more in scale and keeping with the, the um, properties directly adjacent to those. And in the centre of the space, we have um, a water feature, which adds to the, to the tranquility of, of this space. Um, between the buildings, um, as I said, we are really keen on permeability and, and access. Um, the site itself is surrounded by um, listed railings, which you can just see here. We um, punctured through those railings to improve permeability and connections. And these um, routes um, basically connect the, the heart of the, or the, the Whistler Square and the heart of the development back into um, Chelsea Bridge Road. It also um, connects into um, into Bourne Walk, which you can see here. Um, Bourne Walk is a publicly accessible pathway uh, that runs parallel to Chelsea Bridge Road. It provides a quiet buffer uh, between the road and the gardens of the master plan, and it offers um, a respite for the pedestrians from what is a very busy, or can be a very busy thoroughfare um, on the right-hand side. You can see the existing um, London plane trees, which are, uh, they have TPOs, so they're, they're obviously very important. And that's um, been complemented with sort of meadow planting, again, just to create a buffer and a much more um, pleasant place to, to walk. Leading down Bourne Walk uh, takes you into Mul uh, Mulberry Square. Mulberry Square here, as you see here, is the main entrance of um, Chelsea Bridge Road. Um, the central garden to this is where we have our productive garden. Um, you can see those sort of growing happily away there. Um, the, the planters also incorporate um, seating so it offers a, a pleasant place to sit and the uh, water features that are introduced there um, help camouflage or disguise the, the noise of the traffic uh, from Chelsea Bridge Road. Um, again a view looking backward, back the way towards where um, the Royal Hospital is. You can see the, um, uh, the productive garden there um, growing happily away and again some water features that are dotted around the, the master plan. Uh, just um, if you can, you're kind of low on time. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'll, I'll speed up. Yeah. Okay, so th these are views to the, the productive garden, a view towards Garrison Square, where um, the St Barnabas Church spire is the background to that. Um, Garrison Square, you can see here, um, the church is on the left-hand side, where we have constructed new retail and re um, restaurants around that space. And effectively, this is the, the social heart of the Chelsea Barracks Master Plan. So just um, to recap very quickly, um, the master plan is focused on a series of squares and streets that have their own character and function. And the overarching principle in the master plan is to put the public realm first, creating permeable network of streets and squares that offers places to, to play and rest. And that's the end. Thank you very much for listening. Great, thanks very much. <clears throat> so if I could invite our judges back with their comments. Um, I think if I could go to you first, Kenan, if you would like to um, share your thoughts. Of course, thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for the presentation. It was nice, uh, nice to see the design process you've gone through and to have a virtual tour, having visited a few times, it's always nice to see the, the glossy images as well. Um, amazing, sophisticated detailing, beautifully elegant. My question for you is how do you envision the spaces will evolve as people start to grow into it and it becomes a community? How do you see those spaces starting to function? Where do you see those places of gathering? And will it start to really knit into the context to feel like it is a community in that sense? I think um, certainly, I think two years ago, um, the restaurants opened up around Garrison Square. And it was for the first time, this, because of the way the construction process had gone, it was the first opportunity for the site hoarding to come down to reconnect or to allow the, 
the site to connect into its context. And it, that tied in with the um, Chelsea Flower Show. Um, and there was a lot of activity. Obviously, people are coming there throughout the course of the day for that entire week. And there was a lot of people traveling, you know, taking extra time to walk around Chelsea Barracks, but also visit the restaurant at the Garrison Square and continuing the journey onto, um, onto Pimlico Road. Um, I was passing through there on Saturday, and obviously with COVID and things like that, it's, it's probably not the best time to be trying to open up a restaurant. But, but what was really exciting um, was the fact that the, the farmer's market is, 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 is back in, or in Orange Square, and it was very vibrant. The, the pavement cafes along Pimlico Road have, 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 have reopened as well. And I see that as, as a good sign that obviously when Chelsea Barracks does evolve and the other phases become uh, complete and more and more of the site starts to open, I see people moving through that space to get to different places, but also going into that heart to, um, to use the facilities there, stop and have a coffee. It's a very pleasant, um, you know, it's a, it's a nice place to be. I think, you know, cutting in through Dove Place into Whistler Square and onto the garden is actually a very pleasant walk. And I've been, so walking through that dap of light down Boren Walk as well is, 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 is just a nice thing to do. It's a very different experience from the other side of the railing where you've got the cars and buses up and down that road heading up to sort of West London. I see some nodding from Elizabeth, so I'm going to bring her in on the basis of a nod. <laughs> <laughs> Enough to uh, keep my head more still in the future, Christine. Um, <laughs> thank you, Stephen. Really great presentation, um, and I look forward to getting over and seeing it. I, I got a stomach flu last week, so I didn't get to get around quite as much as I wanted to. Um, it's a really beautiful space. You've created a, a, you know, a wonderful new piece of public realm. My question is, I guess simple, but maybe deceptively simple. What's the most fun thing about this place? So if I went there with my kids, what would they really get excited with and enamored of? I'm sure that, that your kids would probably run for the water feature, much to the dismay of, uh, of the residents. But um, I think the, the productive garden is really exciting. Um, again, when we were there, um, when it opened up for um, the flower show, it was good just to see people sort of resting on those benches and, and, and chatting. And I actually bumped into an old friend I hadn't seen for a while, sort of there with his wife, and they were feeding, the, they were sort of bottle feeding the, the child at the time. But what is interesting is the smells and the textures and the tones and the colours of the garden. And you obviously, because it's seasonal as well, you'll see different things growing in, um, in those spaces. And I think as a child, it's, it's, it's quite a, a nice thing to see, to, to learn where food comes from as well, and, albeit it's just herbs and things like that. But, I think that's very informative and it's very, um, yeah, it's just a nice place to, to rest and enjoy the, enjoy the smells and the colors and the textures. I think it's a great question. Are they allowed to go in the water feature? Because I have a feeling my kids would go for that over the uh, textures. It's, it's, it's not very deep. Um, so it's all very safe. I'm sure um, you could go in there and run around and make some nice footprints on the stonework and things like that. But yeah. <laughs> I haven't, Damn, tried, I, haven't, I haven't tried it myself. You haven't tried it yourself, okay. Uh, well, funnily enough, it's exactly related to that because um, it was that issue, it's that, that expression you used about to the dismay of the residents. Um, I was there uh, two Saturdays ago and um, beautiful day. It's, the place is, uh, is, is fantastic. It's immaculate. Um, and you can see that there are things at the edges that, you know, like good public spaces should do kind of invite you in, whether it's the sculpture or the water feature uh, or that linear garden. It, it, it almost creates this moment of curiosity that tells you oh this is a place i should i should go once you're in you really do feel like you're in a residential area which is which is that issue with the, uh, the you you do you want to run through that water feature but you do really do feel it's going to be to the dismay of some residents uh, and i'm just wondering did you feel that as attention throughout um this process um and and if it is a bit of a tension between what is public space and what is you know essentially private space uh, how do you resolve it I think I think the, the master plan is brave, and I think as a I think as a client, it's a very brave thing to do um, to allow people to to wander through what what is effectively a private site, and it's the first time I think in 150 years that people have actually been able to go through the site, um, obviously because of the military barracks and what have you. Um, it, it was a bold decision from Qatari DR to, to to run with these ideas and and allow that permeability, and I think there is. I think everyone can appreciate the, 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 
the social value that it has in terms of it being a neighbourhood and not just a, a gated development that is it's shut off from the city. Um, that was always our main driver. And I think um, as it become, as more people move in, as the other phases um, get developed and there are more facilities opening up again because of COVID and what have you, and, and that sort of being redressed, I think people will start to relax a little bit more. I, you know, I was down there a few weeks back. I had a meeting down there, and there was some there were some uh, kids sort of taking photographs themselves and doing some selfies, sitting on a bench, and the, the concierge was there, but they weren't being particularly um, what's visible. They were just sort of keeping a distant eye on it, and I I, I think that's that's acceptable. I think. Um, yeah, there is intrigue and curiosity to bring you into these places, and it, it's 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 great that you can do that because it'd been quite easily to to have fenced all that off and just made it a private residential development. So I think there's a lot to be said for the the bravery of, of the client to to run with that as a as an ethos to the to the design of the master plan. Great. Well, we have one minute left. If either of you have a follow up question. Feel free to jump in. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just ask a, one very quick wayfinding question because I, I did see the water feature, the garden, and the uh, the square. I just want to make sure the rest of it is future development. It's not like I missed a whole part of the site, is there? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's phase four is the one that sits the other side of the productive garden, and they're well on with the construction of that. And when that opens up, that's when the five fields garden comes into play. And then the other things will come on, the orchard garden and, and the other facilities that are there as well. So there is um, another great swathe of um, construction still to go, and it will slowly evolve and, and reveal itself as and when these pieces are completed. So you right. yeah, you can certainly go down and explore a bit more in a few years' time, I guess. Stephen, well, thank you. Just, oh, sorry, oh, Christine, go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah. I was just going to ask, what, what's the occupation at the moment of the phases is is there is there a bustling community that live there now yeah the the um people are been moving in over the last sort of year or so um i think there's it's it's well occupied um there's obviously cars coming and going every so often as well um i think i, I think once the once the restaurant opens i think there'll be a bit more of a visit presence there because people will start, you, you'll see much more people using it. Um, and obviously as, as the other parts of the development come on as well. But um, yeah, you do see a lot of residents there. If you if you go and sit, sit around, you'll see them moving through, walking their dogs and, and doing a bit of jogging around the site and having a stroll down Born, Born Walk, which is, like I said, is a very lovely uh, space to be. Well, I just want to say that concludes our uh, session. So thank you very much, Stephen, for sharing uh, Chelsea Barracks with us. And you're very your welcome. Thank you. Thank you for listening. And we're now going to go to a break. Uh, and we'll be back right at 4 o'clock with our final two public spaces for the day, which are both in Waltham Forest. So we're on our way to Waltham Forest after this. Um, thank you very much to our judges for this session. If you're in the audience, feel free to, to go to the social lounge, where you'll be transported as if by magic in a moment. Uh, grab a cup of tea and join the table. You can say hello to some other people who are here. And then we'll see you back in the space at um, 4 o'clock for, uh, for our two final projects of the day before the judges decide who will get the golden pineapple for public space. So see you soon. <laughs>